Right, now that the power is back, let's do the last unit we're going to do for today. Learning unit six, groups of companies. So we know that a company by definition is a separate legal person. CC or a company, separate legal person. They have juristic personality. We discussed it all in learning unit five, all the things they can do, they can sue, they can be sued, they have the right to own assets, blah, 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 blah. Um, however, a group of companies, which is a holding company and its subsidiaries, that is an economic entity. A group of, well, it's, the holding company is a legal entity and each of the subsidiary companies is its own legal entity. In total, it is an economic entity. So what does the 2008 Act define a group of companies as? It defines two or more, it defines it as two or more companies that share a holding company and subsidiary relationship. Two or more companies that share a holding company or subsidiary relationship. So, a company controls another. If that other company is its subsidiary, that's number one. If together with a related person, that means two people are connected, or an interrelated person, that means three people are connected. Um, that company controls the majority of the voting rights of the other company. So first one is it, if it's a subsidiary, or if two or three or more people from company, from the first company control the majority of the voting rights in the second company, or the first company has the right to appoint the majority of the directors, or it's um, able to materially influence the um, policy of the second company. So A controls B if B is a subsidiary of A. That's number one. Two, if through an a related or interrelated person, which is two or three respectively, company A controls the majority of the voting rights in company B. Number three, if company A is able to appoint the majority of the directors of company B. Or four, if it is able to materially influence the policy of the other company. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this related interrelated thing. It could be, excuse me, an example of related could be if two, it's two directors in company A that control, or two shareholders in company A that control the majority of the voting rights in company B, or interrelated is three directors. So subsidiary, Related or interrelated person controlling the voting right, the majority of the voting rights, uh, the right to appoint the majority of the directors, or the material, uh, um, or has the ability to materially influence the um, policy of the company. Um, so this, the four things that we've just said, those fall under section three one of the Companies Act. Now, what is a wholly owned subsidiary? It's in the name, essentially. A, a wholly owned subsidiary is when all of the voting rights in a particular company are controlled by another company, or all of the shares are controlled by another company. Okay, great. So let's talk about, so we've talked about section three, one, let's talk about section three, two. And that's going to tell you about the three ways in which voting rights are determined. Now this does get a bit finicky, but just bear with me. 
So the first thing is that voting rights are only exercisable in circumstances. In certain circumstances. You can't just soma khoi. The time that you take those voting rights into account is when a um, particular set of circum when those partic those particular set of circumstances have arisen naturally, or if that particular set of circumstances has arisen because the person who has the voting rights has caused for them to happen. So, for example, you. Look at, so voting rights are only exercisable at a meeting, shareholders meeting. The shareholders meeting could arise naturally. For example, it could be the annual meeting, the, the AGM, the annual general meeting. Or it could be that a meeting has been called because the shareholder has the right to call the meeting. The first thing is that voting rights are only exercisable under certain circumstances. Secondly, um, voting rights are only exercisable on the instructions of the other person. So if you are acting as a proxy um, for someone else, you can only exercise the voting rights that they hold in the way that they told you to exercise those voting rights. So if they tell you to vote for option one, you've got to vote for option one. You can't just someone I'll go for option two. If they say, okay, use your discretion, then you can vote for whatever you bloody want. But you can't vote for option, you can't vote for option two if they say vote for option one. So only exercisable under certain circumstances. They've got to be exercised in accordance with the consent of the person who actually holds them. Um, and the third thing is um, that the if you are acting as a proxy for someone else, they still get the benefit of those voting rights you don't just because so let's say you are voting for um a share payout uh, a, a share dividend payout if just because i'm voting on your behalf for the payout doesn't mean that i suddenly get the payout you still get the payout i'm just working on your behalf so the three things are only exercisable under certain circumstances if you're acting on behalf of someone else, you've got to, as their proxy, you've got to um, work in the way that they told you to do so. And um, the third thing is that um, they are still the beneficiary of those voting rights. You don't suddenly get those, you, you don't suddenly get the benefit of those voting rights. Okay, now let's talk about what consequences happen when there is a group of companies. So the first thing is what happens when, how can a subsidiary company acquire shares in a holding company? They can. That's important to note. They can. So the rule is that if a company has a subsidiary company or more than one subsidiary company, as a collective, all the subsidiary companies cannot hold more than 10% of the holding company in any of the classes, if there is more than one class. If they own shares, in the holding company, they cannot exercise the voting rights. The voting rights are dormant for the time that they are a subsidiary. Because can you just imagine what would happen? They could they could screw around the holding company as much as they wanted. So they're allowed to own the shares, yes, but they're not allowed to exercise the voting rights, and they are only allowed as a collective as a collective to hold um, 
maximum of 10% in each class. So that's the first thing. That's the, so the, it's the acquisition of holding company shares by a subsidiary company. Second thing is director's conduct. So the director cannot use any information um, about a holding company and the subsidiary companies to their own personal advantage, regardless of whether they are the director of the holding company or the subsidiary company or both. And if they are the director of one of them, they cannot use information that they got about the other to further that to further the company of which they are director. Unfortunately, so um, and they cannot and but the most important thing is that they cannot use information either way to their to their personal advantage. So the first thing we've got is the acquisition of holding shares by a subsidiary. Second thing is director's conduct. They cannot use it to their own advantage. Number three is the share offering to employees. Now, the, there's a beautiful gap in the law or an exception. We can put it like that. So employees are of a subsidiary company can be seen as employees of the holding company so that um, for for employee share schemes. So um, yeah, so for example, a an employee of Boxer, which is owned by Pick and Pay still qualifies for the pick and pay shareholder scheme because they are seen as an employee of pick and pay. Now let's talk about disposal. Disposal, remember we said a couple of learning units ago, means getting rid of assets, either through sale or you giving them away or you hoying them or you chucking them, whatever the case may be. It can only happen via special resolution. Um... The, the important thing to note there is that um, if the disposal happens with a partially owned subsidiary, so and I'm slowing down a bit, but I'm just trying to remember everything. There, it has to be done by a special resolution by both boards, by the board of the holding company and by the board of the subsidiary company. If it is a wholly owned subsidiary, obviously you don't need the permission of the board of the, of the subsidiary company. But if it is done by the, uh, by the partially owned, you do need permission from both, which can in itself lead to problems. Financial assistance. What do we do? What, what about loans? Um... There are restrictions because they are related. Um, you cannot give the same sort of rules as with the CCs. You are not allowed to give loans for the purchase of shares in one of the subsidiaries. You are not allowed to give loans, cross-company loans to directors, just like in the CC. Remember, we did the whole thing with the CC. You cannot give a loan to a company with that um, you cannot give a loan to another CC that your, a member of your CC has more than a 50% stake in. Same idea. You cannot give a loan to one of the um, uh, there cannot be cross company loans. There cannot be loans to directors, etc, uh, etc. Et so I know that's a little bit vague, but the thing you need to know is that the same sort of rules apply. Um, so the restrictions that, uh, that uh, apply normally for companies about loans to directors, normally to companies for the purchase of shares, also apply to the other companies in the group. So you just, what applies, f the rules for the one company now are the rules for all the other companies as well. I hope that makes sense. If that does not make sense, we must go through it again. We'll think of a better way to do it. Um, now, with a group of companies, remember, a group of companies is not a legal entity. It is an economic entity. 
So annual financial statements are not required because they're not a legal entity. Any financial statements need to be done in line with IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. However, remember what we said, it is not required from a private company with a public interest score below 100. So, for example, although uh, someone like, a company like Woolworths is a private company, they have a public interest score above 100 because they serve the public on a large scale. So they would have to comply with IFRS. But somebody like a, like a mom and pop store, like a, like a little spaza shop that's registered as a company, would not because they don't have a public interest score above 100. The exception to this whole IFRS rule is that if one company in the group has to do IFRS, then they all do. Other than that, they don't, because it's an economic entity, not a legal entity. Hope that all makes sense. That is six learning units done. If things do not, if things are not clear, then we will go over it again. Just remember the last thing with the financial assistance, the rules for you can't give loans to directors, you can't give loans for the purchase of shares. They also apply to all of the companies in the group now. So every so that rule is for for applies to all of the staff in the entire group now if that makes sense and if it doesn't we'll go over it again and that's learning unit six